<laughs> Welcome everybody to uh, CHI, St. Luke's Health Memorial. We have a very mixed group here. We have doctors, nurses, other health professionals, priests, ministers, community members. We have a, a microcosm of the whole community, don't we? And I hope that you've been able to meet some of your friends and neighbors and, and, uh, and you'll have some good conversation around the table afterwards. My name is Jay Gilchrist. I'm a VP of Mission Integration here. And we try to integrate our mission in everything that we do. We're all on a mission from God, aren't we? No matter if we work here or not, God gives us a calling. So, we're going to be hearing today from Father Charlie Bouchard about the art of a happy death. And it's something that we all face, isn't it? Something that we all deal with. It's something that uh, I pray for wisdom for in my own dying. You need a lot of wisdom for it and for you know letting go of our parents and our loved ones, whether it be tragedy or, or expected. I look for wisdom in scripture, I look for wisdom in poetry, and I found something uh, by Emily Dickinson that's very, very short, but it really says a really, really lot, and it kind of it kind of juxtaposes the two things that we deal with when we, when we talk about our life. So, in this short life that only lasts an hour, how much, how little, is within our power. So we have the power to do a lot. But we also have to let go, don't we? So that's my prayer that we'll learn some things from Father Charlie about that today, from beginning from the maybe 1500s on up. And uh, But let's just bless our food and have a little moment of prayer. Lord our God, thank you for bringing this group together. We praise you and thank you for giving us each the gift of life. We thank you and praise you for giving us the gift of those that have gone before us and those that will come after us. We are here in, in between the generations. And we're privileged and pleased and proud to be a part of this world. We praise you and thank you for that. We ask you to help us make the most of this time and every minute that we, every breath that we have. Bless our food, bless our fellowship, bless our ministries here in this hospital and throughout all of our community. In Jesus' name, we make our prayer. Father Charlie Bouchard is uh, Senior Director of Ethics and Theology for the Catholic Health Association. And we're privileged to have him here in our community. He's a Dominican priest. And the, you know, many of you know that the, the sisters in the monastery over here are Dominican sisters. And uh, uh, Father Marcos is their chaplain. He's over at this table over here. Um, so it helped us make a connection because they, they bring in some of their people to you know help inform their sisters and give them up to date on theology and things. So we're piggybacking on that visit with Father Charlie to to help us update our theology and our understanding of ethics a little bit. So, Father Charlie uh, just started in September with the Catholic Health Association. Uh, he has been recently the, uh, the uh, superior of the Midwest province, the Chicago province of the Dominican Friars. Uh, he has worked for Ascension Health in the field of ministry formation. He has taught in uh, formation in seminary you know, for the Dominican um, uh, School of Theology, and uh, written several books on ethical matters. So we're pleased and proud to have you here, and I'll just turn it over to you for the second. Uh, thank you, Jay, for the kind introduction, and also to all of you for making time today to come uh, here about death, something in which we all have a vested interest, or at least will have, at some point in the future. Uh, you know, it's amazing to get this many people together for lunch about death. <laughs> but um, if you're a bottom line kind of person, what I'm going to say today is that we used to have a strong tradition of death as a spiritual experience. We lost it, and we got to get it back. 
So like I said, if you're bottom line, you can go now. That's kind of where we're gonna end up today. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll try to fill that in, and I want to use a little bit of historical material here to show uh, what I think has happened over the centuries, uh, some good things, some not so good things, and to point out, maybe uh, engage in some conversation with you about how we can recover this tradition of um, the spirituality of death, or the ars moriendi, which is simply a Latin way of saying the art of dying. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. Or another term is the happy death, which is a term that Catholics used to use a lot. Some of you may have heard that. And there are a lot of prayers in our tradition for a happy death. And I think, you know, understanding exactly what that means, praying for it, helping others prepare for it, is a part uh, of our responsibility, not only as healthcare providers, but as clergy and just as ordinary folks who want to help one another. Um, the picture that, that's at the bottom here, this little woodcut, is from the 15th century. And it's one of the illustrations of these, this whole body of literature called the Ars Moriendi, or the Art of Dying literature. And these things were written beginning in the middle of the um, 1400s after the plague in Europe, which you know about at least a third of the population died, and that affected the clergy as well. And as a result, people began to realize that as they died, there simply was not going to be any priest or clergyman present uh, to provide them with prayers or the last rites or the Eucharist or anything else. And so these little handbooks, really, they were kind of a do-it-yourself guide to dying as a Christian became enormously popular and they went through um, they went through thousands of translations and editions over about 300 years and uh, there's another woodcut here they they often tended to portray the same thing they obviously had a patient who is central to the whole issue there were usually uh, illustrations of angels as well as demons which you see down in the corner which illustrated the struggle between good and evil between sin and salvation and then in the background there were usually family members and saints which indicated that the dying person was kind of between heaven and earth. You know, what Catholics call the communion of saints, both the living and the dead, all of those who have been saved by the blood of Christ and who hope to achieve salvation and come into the presence of God. So there are a lot of these illustrations which help people understand exactly what this mystery of death was about in a society that was largely not literate. You know, most people did not read at this point. Um, so you can see that the, there were editions done in English, the Ars Moriendi, uh, in French is the second one, The Way of Dying Well and The Sick Man's Salve. Those were both kind of Middle English titles. They were also published in German. And as I said, they were kind of a virtual priest enabling people to die in community, surrounded by those who were important with them. And if we had a little more time, we could go through the format of these, which involved questions of the dying person, you know, about their faith, about their belief in God, their belief in Christ's salvation. Um, they would ask them if they were truly sorry for their sins. They would ask them, kind of just to cover all the bases, if you recover, will you amend your life? So they wanted to make sure that they didn't miss an opportunity here. Uh, then there were prayers by the people who were gathered around. Then there was a, a, a blessing at the end. So the format was fairly uh, similar in all of these. But the whole point of it was that even in the absence of the official church's presence through a priest, there was this means of accompanying people through death as a spiritual experience. Um, and I think this was largely true up until modern times, mainly because we didn't have a lot of health care to get in the way. I mean, death was pretty much just a spiritual experience. It was you, your family, your community, maybe the church if it was present, and you prepared to die. Ars moriendi, a process of preparing to die. And I don't think that these were morbid or depressing kinds of things. They were simply a reality, you know, a, a, uh, an acknowledgement of the nearness and unexpectedness of death. 
that it could come at any time and that it um, uh, was something that you know we simply had to be ready for. There's a quote here again from one of these uh, brochures which I think reflects a view of death that most of us today do not have. It's kind of written a little bit in archaic English but it says man look and see take heed of me how shalt thou be when thou art dead dry as a tree worms shall eat thee thy great beauty shall be like lead now you know that's pretty pretty sobering <laughs> I mean that doesn't leave much room to beautify or dis distance yourself from death and I think this was a common experience of most people through history until very recently death was death um, I remember one time visiting Europe and I was, you know, you go in these cathedrals and there are tombs of royalty and so forth. And I don't remember where I was, but there was one tomb and they had the figures on top of them, you know, carved in stone. And there was this one uh, figure that was almost naked and it was lying in the tomb like this, but s carved into the stone were all the embalmer stitches on this bare, bare chest. And I thought, boy, they had a very different understanding of death than we do. You know, they were very close to it in a way that we are not today for a lot of different reasons. And I think that's part of the reason that we've lost this kind of spiritual dimension of death because we don't encounter it as immediately as people did uh, historically. Uh, you know, when I pointed out those woodcuts there, which had the angels and the demons and the dying person and the pe people around them, I was amazed one day when I was at a museum and I came across this painting called Swing Low, which is based on the old African-American spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And I couldn't believe it when I looked at it that this thing has exactly the same elements in it as these 15th century woodcuts. We've got the patient gathered with his family and apparently the, the doctor's car is here, I'm assuming. We've got the angels, we've got the demons, and we've got the chariot coming to get this dying person, you know, kind of between heaven and earth. So 500 years later, we've got basically the same kind of illustration here of the struggle between sin and salvation, the, the community, the dying person, and uh, the transition or the position between heaven and earth. So I, I had to start using this every time I gave this presentation because I just thought it was a re remarkable historical um, transition. In modern times, especially after the French Revolution and the beginning of the Enlightenment, that was really the beginning of science as we know it today. Uh, and there were people like Galileo and a few others, some of the Greek philosophers who certainly had a scientific understanding of the world. But the scientific method as we know today and medicine as we know it today really did not begin to develop until about 1800. And uh, we see here a picture of one of the first uh, surgeries performed under anesthesia. I think it was in Baltimore about 1880, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I can't quite read that, what it says underneath there. But some writers have referred to this as the birth of the clinic. Not the clinic as we know it today, but the clinic as kind of a research institution, you know, any kind of teaching institution. Obviously, other physicians there were present watching this, what must have been a horrible experience for the patient, you can only imagine. But uh, nonetheless, the patient was being observed here. You know, a little ether might have helped somewhat, but I don't think it's quite what anesthesiologists would hope for today. Um, so the clinic was the beginning of a different understanding of death in which death was no longer primarily a spiritual experience but it was an object of scientific curiosity and the focus changed from helping people to die to helping to heal or cure them. Clearly a good thing. You know none of us are troubled about that, but like many other things, it had unintended uh, consequences. Michel Foucault, who was a uh, philosopher in the uh, a French philosopher in the early 20th century, uh, wrote a book about dying, and he really coined this term, the clinic. And he says that as opposed to what we had before, which is this. Sp sp uh, spiritually rich understanding of dying that the clinic introduced 
a scientific and pathology approach to medicine, which was objective and empirical. And he referred to that as the clinical gaze, you know, which I hope all of you who are in medicine gain to some extent. The ability to look at a patient with the eyes of science and, and medical knowledge and to try to understand what's happening here. He said that this developed, you know, it was a good thing, but it developed partly uh, in reaction to the church and to religion. And so there was a real strong emphasis after the French Revolution and the Enlightenment on pure and unadulterated religion, uh, I mean pure and unadulterated science that would be free of any religious influence. And he said that it tended to see persons as scientific objects rather than as persons and to see them as the objects of scientific manipulation rather than to understand death as a spiritual process. Like I said, I'm not, clearly don't want to argue against advances in clinical medicine, but as I said, there was an unintended consequence in which we maybe over-objectified the patient or lost sight of additional aspects of the human person, which we would <coughs> describe as the spiritual aspect. You know, because even if, if we're not religious, I think most of us would agree that people have an innate spiritual sense. You know, it may not take the form of organized religion, but every person has that kind of innate spirituality built in. And healthcare, to be fully effective, has to take account of that as well as the more empirical dimensions of the person, the more physical dimensions. Dan Solmese, who is a, both a physician and a Franciscan brother, uh, wrote a book called The Rebirth of the Clinic. And what he's saying here is that um, the clinic that Michel Foucault describes, the reality, but we need to rebirth the clinic to recreate or to create a new kind of medicine which takes advantage of all our scientific advances, but which also is able to recover attention to the spiritual dimension of the person, especially the person who is in the process of dying. And he says in that book that medicine, after the Enlightenment, came to, and I hate that word, eschew, uh, I don't think I ever pronounced it right, but let's say that medicine came to avoid the, the mystical. It became blind to the mystery within the person of the patient and blind to the mystery that lay beyond the range of its scientific gaze. And I think those of you who have studied medicine or who are clinicians can see how that could happen. You know, your training is focused on the scientific aspects of medicine largely. Now that's begun to change uh, happily, I think both in nursing and in medical education. And some of you may want to comment on that uh, in a few moments here. So he says, or actually Philippe Ariès, who's another Frenchman who wrote a big thick book on the hour of our death, kind of a cultural history of dying. He says in here, in his book, that this modern scientific approach to medicine produced what he calls the wild death, you know, as opposed to that kind of tame death that we saw portrayed in the 14th and 15th century. He said it was a death marked by undue fear and uncertainty, by medical powers which we think are not quite within our mastery, painful course of decline, and perhaps worst, isolation and degradation of patients who are removed from a full presence in the life of family and community. Now again, I know that we are in the process of trying to address some of those things today. I know they're widely recognized uh, in, in hospital care and health care today. But this wild death was one in which victims or, or patients were subjected to it and, and felt that they had lost control over their own destinies. There's all kinds of stories, you know, about kind of horror stories from medical care. If any of you have read Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, has anybody seen that? You know, he's a physician at uh, Mass General, I think, who's written a lot. It's a very easily readable book. A layman could read it. But he talks about the experience from his perspective as a physician of dying and of mortality. And he has stories in there that all of us can relate to about patients dying who couldn't get out of the tangle of medical care, who got, you know, sucked into the system, couldn't escape, their wishes weren't well respected, their family was fighting, they were overtreated, you know, all those kind of things which are hazards, 
uh, unintended, but they are hazards of modern medical care. Um, so if you haven't read that book, you, you might want to take a look at it. He also wrote one called, I think it was called Outcomes, and another one about surgery. And like I said, it's, he's very accessible. It's not a technical book at all, but it gives you, gave me, as a non-clinician, real insight into what it looks like from the physician's perspective. And even if we're not healthcare providers, we've had these experiences with family and friends. Um, I was telling somebody earlier that even though I taught medical ethics for years, when my dad had a serious stroke, that's a whole different thing. I mean, I had to run all those tapes through again. You know, when you're dealing it on a personal pers perspective, you're not just in front of a classroom. This is my dad who was dying, you know. And so all of us, from some angle, face that, that reality of, of dying as a clinical and as a spiritual experience. So let's talk a little bit, this is another woodcut here, which again graphically portrays that struggle between sin and salvation. You've got these <coughs> armed demons there prodding at the patient. You've got the angel. In that little figure up at the top, sometimes these wood prints portray the soul as a little person. So the soul is really escaping there. I think that's what it's trying to portray. So this little simple drawing is really trying to show the spiritual dimension of death. Now, there's not even a doctor present. Uh, and then we've got, obviously, a more, um, a more contemporary example. Um, I think one of, if we talk about, you know, why did we lose the spiritual dimension of death? Why is it hard for us to reclaim the idea of a happy death. Many years ago, this physician talked about the medicalization of death. You know, we all know what that means. Um, we haven't fixed that yet. It's, it's still a reality for us. Uh, and that's part of the reason we, we don't make enough room. Uh, a chaplain was telling me recently the other day that, uh, you know, sometimes that, that there's a lack of integration between spiritual and clinical care. Um, and that as soon as they find out nothing more medical can be done, we'll then call the chaplain. Well, all right, that's better than nothing, but I think we can do better at bringing those two things together. Um, another thing is obviously that our experience of health care and of death itself have changed dramatically just even in the last hundred years, let alone uh, in the period before that. Uh, if you look at average life expectancy, which in the early 1900s was about 50 years, today it's almost 80. So we've gained 30 years uh, in life expectancy. And all of us know our patient populations are getting older. Uh, chronic illnesses, which you know people didn't have in the past, usually for 30 or 40 years, they do now. You know, so our approach to treatment has to change. The focus in the past of health care for dying patients was comfort care delivered at home. Many people died at home. Today, very few do. Although, again, we're moving toward more home care, which enables that. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the focus today is not just comfort care, but curing disease, prolonging life and symptom management. And we see palliative care, which is an excellent example of symptom management geared toward patients who cannot be cured. Major, major causes of death in the past, up until very recently, were accidents, childbirth, and infectious diseases, most of which were not predictable. So that people died fairly suddenly and unexpectedly. They didn't have a lot of time to think about this in most cases. Today, the primary causes of death are heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And most patients today know that they're going to die. Um, this report said that only 10% of deaths today are unexpected. That 90% of us who die will know that death is coming. Now, that's the good news and the bad news, you know, because we've got to struggle with knowledge about our own diagnosis, our prognosis. Sometimes there's more information than we want. And I know patients will sometimes say, I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> that's enough. Um, but the fact is it also gives us the opportunity then to make or to recover a spiritual dimension to dying because we simply have a lot more time to do it. We can, can and should accompany patients through the process of dying both as a clinical and as a spiritual reality. 
And then obviously financing has changed dramatically. I mean, even in 1950, I don't know what the figures are, but healthcare costs were a fraction of what they were, are today because there wasn't that much healthcare to go around. Well, today there's a whole lot to go around and it's very expensive. And this, a couple of these statistics here, 83% um, of people die in Medicare. That means, you know, they're under, they're covered by federal payment. And 50% of women die in Medicaid. Now think about that for a moment. You know, what does that mean about women who die? You know, it means poverty, it means lack of resources. You know, we've got a whole other set of issues here. Uh, women who are not covered by regular health insurance and who die uh, on Medicaid funding. So our health care financing, I think we spend about $2 billion a day in this country on health care right now. That may even be underestimate, a, a low estimate. Um, and the, one of the problems we face is that financing for health care is not transparent. Most patients have no idea how their medical bills get paid. It's an enormous amount of money. You know, maybe we see a, a, an insurance statement, you know, patient share but most people don't read it, they don't understand it. Um, you know, I used to tease when I was working with boards and, and senior leaders, I would tease them about how they arrived at medical charges. You know, where did those numbers come from? Well, <laughs> nobody was exactly clear. What's the relation between costs and charges, you know? And that we don't see clearly how healthcare is paid for, and that often then leads to lack of responsibility for people's own health care. And of course, at the end of life, it just gets more complicated. Um, I think another thing that has made the spiritual dimension of death difficult is a shift in the locus of moral authority for, for health care decision making. Uh, you know, uh, we've got really, we've had two extremes here. I think most of history was probably a time of medical paternalism in which you just did what the doctor told you. Doctor didn't share a lot of information. There may not have been much information to share, you know, but um, then more recently, at least for a while, we might have gone through a phase of a kind of radical individualist autonomy where some people wanted to see the physician as just a resource or an agent. You know, you give me the information, I'll tell you what to do. Well, clearly, neither of those are workable today. And so we've got the patient, we've got medical providers, we have clinical information here, which is vast, and it probably should be four times this amount, you know, in terms of its proportion. And we're obviously moving toward a collaborative model of decision making, in which the patient is much more actively involved than they have ever been in the past. And they have to enter into a partnership with care providers, uh, especially their physician. But then, of course, we've got hospitalists, we have specialists, we have primary care physicians, we have physician's assistants. So we've still got all of these levels of health care. And of course, the nurse, who at least in inpatient situations, is with the patient more than anybody else. And the family should be here, too. I'm sure all of you have had at least occasional instances of a medical setting being complicated by family involvement. In fact, most of the high profile ethical disasters that we read about in the newspaper, especially with dying patients, are because of conflicts between family members. That's really what causes most of them. So we, we are in a period here where we have a lot of medical care, a lot of decisions to be made, a lot of parties involved, a lot of information, and we're still trying to figure out how to manage all this. Uh, some of you who are nurses may remember about, this is probably 15 or 20 years ago now, there was a study called the Support Study about communication between patients and providers. Does anybody remember hearing about that? Well, it was, trying, it was funded by a foundation and it was, uh, it was uh, carried out at several large medical centers in the country. And the problem was, that patients' wishes were not respected adequately, they were spending too much time in intensive care, and they were suffering too much pain. So this foundation thought, all right, the problem here is that, you know, we're not, there's a communication problem here. <laughs> if we can just improve communication, we'll make some of these things go away. So they trained uh, nurses especially to be special agents of communication acting between the physician, the patient, the family. 
and this went on for several years. At the end of it, patients were in the ICU unit just as long, their wishes were respected just as infrequently, and they suffered from pain just as often. So that was a rather discouraging <laughs> outcome. Now, as I said, this was a while ago, and I think we've made progress since then, especially with hospice and palliative care. But it just shows the complexity of this particular issue here, and how are we going to fix that? Uh, a few other ethical distinctions which I think contribute to the problem as well. One of them is the basic idea of when we die. You know, how do we know when, we're, when, we're, or when somebody is dead? Uh, just the other day, I heard somebody refer to, the, to Terry Schiavo as brain dead. Terry Schiavo was not brain dead. But even respectable journals and newspapers misuse that term as though when you're brain dead, somehow you might come back from that. Well, you don't, you know. <laughs> when you're dead, you're dead. Um, and that gets mixed up with whole brain death, cardiac death. And these terms are sometimes used interchangeably in a way that does not help patients and families. You know, it, it really contributes. A and I think one of the issues we face here is publicity. You know, that a lot of these things are mediated in the press uh, and on the evening news. That's not always helpful. In fact, it's usually not helpful because two minutes, you're not going to be able to come to convey the ethical complexities of these situations. We can't talk often about the patient's condition uh, because of HIPAA. And so then the press makes it up, basically. You know, what you don't tell them, they make it up. I hope nobody here is a journalist or married to one. I, I mean, I understand what they're dealing with, but. Um, and that creates a big dilemma for communications people in healthcare systems, you know. Uh, another problem is the difference between PVS and coma, persistent vegetative state, which I think is probably what was present in most of the highly conflicted cases we've dealt with, like Terry Schiavo, but there have been many others. There was research done some years ago, ago by Ronald Cranford, who was a neurologist at Hennepin County Medical Center in uh, Minnesota, and I know there's been more done since then, in which he tried to clinically distinguish these two conditions. And basically, as most of you know, what we're talking about with PVS is uh, eyes open unconsciousness because it's not brain death, although the patient may have permanently lost consciousness due to death or damage to the upper part of the brain. The lower part of the brain continues to control some uh, reflexes, which could even involve swallowing being on a waking and sleeping cycle, and so the patient kind of, kind of wakes and sleeps, whereas coma is unresponsive, you know. But PVS is where the complications come in, the difficulties, because the patient can appear to be responsive. And we don't ever know for certain, of course. We, we can only go on external indications. But this has created a lot of problems, especially when the press gets a hold of it. The distinction between killing or letting die, we've got euthanasia now and assisted suicide available in some states as an option. I think this itself, the fact that this has come to pass, is a result of our inability to have provided adequate end of life care. I don't think most people would be considering suicide or uh, 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 euthanasia if they were cared for properly as they're dying, but they're afraid of the wild death. They're afraid of losing control, of suffering a lot of pain, of dying in an ICU unit. I mean, most of us, I, my dad was worried about that. You know, I, I, we talked about it. Um, and so I think that we haven't adequately responded to this. So people say, well, all right, I'm going to take this into my own hands here, and I'm going to arrange for assisted suicide or euthanasia. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, even where it's allowed legally. But our best. Um, our best argument and our best uh, approach to uh, eliminating this or reducing it is really adequate end-of-life care. A um, question of how do I decide, you know, we mentioned earlier the, the difficulty and complexity of decision-making. You know, from the Catholic tradition at least, most medical decisions are made on the basis of burden and benefit. You know, it's as simple as that. We assess the burdens of a particular course of treatment, and its expected benefits. 
And that's how we arrive at these two terms here, what at least we in our tradition refer to as ordinary care, which would be something that's morally obligatory, which somebody would undergo, and extraordinary care, uh, extraordinary means, which we would say in which we would say that the burden is greater than the benefit and so it may not be you know may not be morally required and it's always a question of making that calculation there is no list of ordinary and extraordinary treatments you know it's all very subjective um, for for example for myself as a 60 something year old man who's in relatively good health if I were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow and the physician offered me some alternatives chemotherapy radiation surgery um, I would make the judgment about burdens and benefits based on my current state however if I were 30 years older if this was my third incident of cancer, if I had multiple comorbidities, I would probably make that calculation very differently and say, you know, doctor, I've been through this twice already. I don't want to do this. And that's okay. You know, this is a flexible calculation which can change along with the patient's condition. So it isn't once and for all. Closely related to this is the problem of withholding and withdrawing treatment. And, you know, sometimes um, patients or even physicians fear to withdraw a treatment once it's been started because we're killing the patient. Anybody ever heard that? Or? And really, again, ethically, there's no difference between those two things. We make the same calculation of burdens and benefits whether we are starting a treatment for the first time or whether we are considering withdrawing it. We make the judgment about it in exactly the same way. It's just that sometimes you start a treatment, it's clear that it's not working very well. So before you started it, the burdens looked relatively minor, the benefits looked pretty good. After you know a couple courses of treatment, you say, physician says, you know, this is really not having the results we expected and suddenly that calculation shifts. The burdens of it, which could include, include cost or inconvenience, suddenly become greater than the benefits, and that treatment at that point then becomes ethically extraordinary or not obligatory for a given patient. There's no general rule about these. It's gonna be different for every patient. It has to be calculated according to that patient's condition, and it's highly subjective. You know, some patients are willing to just go for it no matter what. Others are going to say, I, I don't want to do that again. It's okay. It's all okay. As long as the patient is adequately informed and, you know, is making a judgment based on uh, valid indication. Uh, principle of double effect. Um, this is, it, I, I, we won't get too much into this, but it's really the principle that we use with almost any invasive treatment. Anything that causes, you know, any incision, any pain that we cause to a patient, we, it's always based on this principle of double effect, which means that a single action could have two effects or consequences, one good and one bad. So even something as simple as having a tooth pulled, <laughs> you know, it's not much pain, but it's a little pain. We wouldn't ordinarily pull out a tooth from a healthy person, but we pull out a diseased tooth um, because the patient's health requires it. So the act of pulling that tooth has two effects. One good, which is therapeutic. The other bad, which is causing the patient pain and discomfort. But we only intend the good effect. Now this gets very complicated in practice, especially when we're dealing with pregnancy and obstetrics and you know, other things. It's not quite as simple as pulling a tooth. But the basic principle here is that there are some actions have two effects. We intend the good effect, only foresee the bad effect, but we can tolerate it. It's okay. We use this principle every day in healthcare. Almost anything we do to a patient, we're doing it for the therapeutic effect, even though it is causing some pain or harm. And we can come back to this a little bit later if, if you want. One of the other things that's very problematic today, especially with artificial hydration and nutrition for patients who are not uh, competent or not able to express their own wishes, is whether that constitutes a treatment or not. If it does, 
then it falls under the burdens and benefits calculation, clearly. No problem about that. Uh, a conscious patient could decide to forego artificial um, nourishment if he or she just could not tolerate the NG tube, for example. And I've never had one, but I've, people say it's pretty unpleasant, huh? Uh, so a patient could legitimately say, I, I just can't deal with this anymore. I don't want it. Take it out. Now, when a patient is unconscious, the question is different because they can't answer for themselves. But the big issue here, the reason these cases have been so controversial, is because there's dispute about whether hydration and nutrition, especially for an unconscious or persistently unconscious patient, is a treatment or is it just ordinary care? You know, now if it's ordinary care, then we would be morally obliged to continue to provide it. Um, the church, the Catholic Church in its teachings has, uh, uh, has fallen on the side of a presumption in favor of artificial hydration and nutrition for PVS patients. It says, in principle, we should provide this as ordinary care. But I think in using the term in principle, it allows that there are some circumstances in which it could be legitimately withdrawn. Um, and as you know, there are some uh, counterindications for artificial feeding. You know, there can be uh, pneumonia, um, there sometimes is bleeding or tear of tissues. So there are really clinical reasons why it could be drawn apart from this question, you know, the, the other questions. But uh, that's kind of what we're, what we're dealing with and why those cases are so problematic. They don't often happen in acute care settings. It's usually in nursing homes where we run into this. So probably you don't encounter it here that much, but you know, nursing situations would be another story. Again, we can come back to this a little if you want. Uh, just to mention a little caveat about the terms quality of life and death with dignity. You know, they're both slogans, which mean a lot of different things to people, and so we need to be careful when we use them. Quality of life is definitely an important concept in determining future courses of treatment, but it has to always be um, approached from the perspective of the patient. You know, the patient makes the judgment about his quality of life, not me as a physician or a clergyman. I remember one day I was teaching undergraduates and I was standing up there talking about acceptable quality of life and I'm thinking, you know, these 22 year olds probably are not sure I have an acceptable quality of life. Because <laughs> they were kind of glazed over like, what is he talking about? <laughs> um, so it is a highly subjective thing, but it has to stay as close to the patient as possible, as do all healthcare decisions. You know, the further away they get from the patient, the more problematic it is. A um, couple more things here would be proxy decisions. You know, what do you do when the patient can't make his or her own decision? Uh, there are two ways to go about that. If you know the patient's wishes and have been delegated by a durable power of attorney or some other legal document, then you replicate the patient's wishes as closely as you can. On the other hand, if you're dealing with an infant, for example, you have to do the burdens and benefits calculation for them because they've clearly never had the opportunity to make their own wishes known. So the parents and or the providers make the best judgment they can about the relative burdens and benefits of a particular course of treatment for a seriously ill newborn. Again, very difficult decisions, but we, those are the only two kinds of options we have here when you're a proxy. Futility, uh, the term that we prefer today, you know, we say we avoid the F word, uh, futility. The term we prefer is non-beneficial treatment. But we can often talk about a treatment which is futile, and there are two ways to describe that. One would be a medical or physiological futility, which is based on the probability of effect of a particular medication or course of treatment. And this would be a case in which a physician would say to a patient, well, you know, this just isn't going to work for your condition. I, I mean, we know that what this drug is designed for, it's just not going to work here. So there is the probability of actually having an effect on you is limited or none. So we would judge that treatment or that medication to be futile. 
But there's another one which is from the patient's perspective rather than the scientific or physician's perspective in which we would talk about normative futility and what we're dealing with there is not the probability of, of the effect but the value of it. So the physician might say to a patient, all right, we can use this round of chemotherapy. It will be minimally effective at best. Do you want to try it? So there is a probability of effect, but then the patient's decision here is whether that effect is worth it or not. What is the value of that to me? So you can see again here, we're blending kind of empirical considerations with more subjective considerations on the part of the, uh, of the patient. Inability to accept limits. Um, I think we deal, we live in a society in which we are just not accustomed to being defeated and everything seems possible. And this is a problem for providers as well as for patients. You know, and uh, in terms of healthcare reform, I've often said that I don't think we can have meaningful healthcare reform in this country until we face the reality of death. You know, we just, it, it, it can only go so far because we're not dealing with reality in a lot of cases here, especially when we're not paying for it. You know, and we can say all kinds of things are desirable, especially since someone else is paying the bill. Um, you know, these questions are all important for, um, for patients, but I think there's a real important question for physicians and other care providers as well, something we sometimes refer to as moral distress. You know, healthcare is what we would refer to as a liminal profession, the word liminal meaning on the threshold, and all of you deal with death and dying, with life and death every day. And some of you, I think there was somebody here, well, somebody who's from ICU, you know, you are right on the front lines of all that. What does that do to you? You know, priests do it to some extent, and ministers, we deal with intimate death and life things, but not in as intense a way as you do. And I think part of our restoring the spiritual dimension of healthcare is making sure that we're providing ways to take care of health care providers because their spiritual lives are important too. This picture, um, I only saw this a couple weeks ago, a physician who was giving a presentation showed it to me. It was a picture snapped by an EMT outside the emergency room at the parking lot of an emergency room department. And this young resident had just lost a 19-year-old patient. And I'm not even sure if it's a man or a woman, but he or she went out and this EMT just caught the picture. But it's a graphic portrayal of the stress that physicians experience. Do you all have anyone to talk to about that? Where do you put it? You know, all of you deal with that. Uh, and the closer you are to the bedside, the harder it gets. What do you do with clinical failures when you make a mistake? What do you do with clinical failures when you didn't make a mistake? You did everything right. So we need to also help physicians and other providers um, go deeper into their own spiritual lives and say, you know, what about that? What about me deep down? You know that the suicide rate for physicians is much higher than uh, the average for other folks. That says something to us. Um, and I think for both patients and for care providers, it's important for us to remember that death should not be a solitary experience. That we, have, we, we owe, owe it to one another to be able to die in community uh, and to help have others help us with death, even if we're only observing it or treating patients who are dying. So simply caregivers need care. This is about the role of caregivers, but I think it also suggests that caregivers need to have someone to help them too. Um, I was at a conference last week, a physician's forum sponsored by the Catholic Health Association, and we had about 75 physicians there, and we spent time having some pretty intense conversations about how they handle their own spiritual and psychological needs as physicians. Um, the church, I don't think we, at least our church, is not providing enough help. 
One other thing I would say, I'm almost done here, I want to leave a few moments for discussion. We don't only need good doctors and nurses, we need better patients. <laughs> I'm sure a few of you <laughs> have had occasion to think about that uh, now and then. I remember once when we were talking about, I was at a meeting where they were talking about how we shouldn't be using the word non-compliant because that's solely from the provider's perspective. And this nurse sitting next to me says, well, yeah. <laughs> You know, but um, the issue is here that often our own patients are not prepared to deal with serious illness and death. And I think here much of the responsibility falls on our pastors and our parishes and congregations. That we haven't served people well in getting them to face the reality of death or even the reality of serious illness. Um, f that's one of the reasons that we published at Catholic Health Association these two little booklets earlier this year. One of them is caring for people at the end of life, and the other one is expressing health care wishes. And they're very user-friendly little brochures that are geared to at least opening a conversation with people about death, about end-of-life care, about how they would want to die, how they can express their wishes. And uh, we have sold, or not sold necessarily, but distributed 60,000 of these since July. So there's clearly a need. They're available in both Spanish and English. Uh, but it's a way in which we can open the discussion, because I think too often, I've seen it happen in my own family, when you know, an elderly person says, well, you know, I'm not going to be around long anyway. They say, oh, Grandma, don't talk like that. You're not, you're not going to die. But what we do is frustrate people then who want to talk about what it means to die. And we owe them that. Um, I did a talk, something like this, at a parish not long ago. I had 90 people. I think they were all over 70. They were quite eager to talk about this. And they said, some of them said part of the reason it was there because their family wouldn't talk about it with them. And we shouldn't be doing that. You know, as Christians, we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the afterlife. We believe that death is passage into what we were created for in the first place. We should be willing to have spiritual conversations about that. And we've got great chaplains and pastoral care people here who can do that. That doesn't let families off the hook, you know, because families have got to be involved in this. Um, Again, just another way of saying this, that the fathers of the church, you know, the early fathers, St. Augustine and others, said that the unremitting remembrance of death is a principal virtue of life. Uh, St. Benedict, who founded a lot of monasteries, said to his monks, keep death ever before your eyes. You know, not, again, not to be morbid, but just that it is the pinnacle of our lives and it's our transition into the presence of God. I mean, there aren't too many things more important than that. Okay, so let me just then move toward a couple thoughts about what we can do. Uh, if we ask people how they would like to die, according to this poll, 90% would prefer to die at home. 80% want to avoid hospitalization in the ICU, with all respect to our ICU uh, staff here. Um, I lived in a community of priests. It was our assisted living center for our elderly priests. We had a meeting one night, and I asked them the same question. They said exactly the same thing. They said, I don't want to go to the emergency room again. I want to die alone, and I don't want to go to the ICU. You know, these were all priests over 80 years old, some of them with multiple chronic conditions. We haven't been able to deliver on this yet. You know, we're still struggling. We're working on it, and I think we've made some real progress, but... Um, yet, in spite of people's wishes, the LA Times reported a while ago that hospitalizations for the last six months of life, at least in whatever area they were reporting on, were increasing. And then with hospice, although we've, you know, we're developing hospice, physicians still are not referring to it as often as they should or as early as they should. You know, the rule of thumb is that if you wouldn't be surprised if your patient died with this within six months, they're a candidate for hospice. And yet, is anyone here involved in hospice? What's the average stay in hospice now, do you know? A week. A week. Okay. So we're falling five months and four weeks short of <laughs> what the goal is. And it, it, and it isn't, obviously, as you know, it isn't giving up on a patient. It's changing the quality of care to match the fact that they're dying. Um, 
finances are an issue here. You know, it's not all about money, but it is partly about money. And when we look at how much of our budget uh, uh, Medicare spends in the last year of life, this is an issue. And it isn't like this is getting the best possible outcome for the patient. You know, in many cases, palliative or hospice care are better outcomes and they're cheaper. And I think we see growing evidence of that, especially with palliative care. Um, another thing I think is that we need to be aware that there are multiple trajectories for chronic and terminal illness, that all patients should not be treated the same and certainly not all in an acute care model. For example, um, often the decline or the trajectory of terminal cancer looks something like this. You know, your things progress pretty well, then there's a fairly dramatic drop off. This could be repeated. Mostly chronic heart uh, disease or lung failure looks different. Frailty and dementia looks different yet. You know, a very slow and gradual decline with some. So obviously the acute care model does not work well for all of these patients, maybe even for most of them. Uh, palliative, I think you all know the difference between the two, but a lot of patients don't. You know, they still think they're the same thing. I, I just recently I encountered somebody whose sister was going into palliative care and she said, does that mean she's dying? And I said, no, not necessarily. But I think all of you know that palliative care means management of chronic illnesses in a way that enhances the quality of life. Hospice care is enhancing the, pa uh, the life of a dying patient. That's a real important distinction which a lot of folks are not aware of. And we need to make that um, better known. You know, if you could look at this as the old medical model where you've got, you know, you keep punching away until the end and then the bottom drops out and the patient dies. No, no, we're, we're away from that. But this is a way that Ascension Health tries to look at a palliative care model in which you do have disease modifying treatment which can happen with palliative care and gradually, you know, it's up and down, but it gradually gives away to hospice, to death, and then to bereavement and family services after. It seems to me this is the direction we're going to go. And these last two slides are just about quality imperatives for palliative care. I know that we deal with it clinically, we deal with it on the patient aspect, we deal with it with administrations and boards, so you've got to make a case for it. You know, what's the value proposition here? And I think evidence is that palliative care works better for the patient and that there are fiscal imperatives or fiscal benefits for it too. These statistics are, I think these are over a year old, so. So to conclude then, what can we do? I think it's important for us both as facilities and as systems to continue uh, to invest in models of non-acute care which offer the opportunity for accompanying patients through chronic illness and dying. Um, I think that we, especially hospice and palliative care, that we need to enlist area pastors and congregations to help us educate patients so that we get better patients when they come to us who understand about dying, who are able to talk about it, who are able to deal with mortality in a constructive way. One time in Wichita, when I gave a talk like this, a bunch of funeral directors showed up. <laughs> and I was a little bit taken aback at first, but they said to me the reason they came was because the family's experience at the hospital made a big difference when they got to the funeral home. And they said, we wanted to hear how you talk about death and dying here, because they could tell right away when a family came in whether they had had a good or bad experience at the hospital. And so they said, we, we kind of wanted to talk with you all about this. And I thought that was pretty great, you know. So we had a pretty interesting discussion. It was residents and funeral directors. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, address issues of care provider spirituality. You know, the stress, the anxiety, the moral distress that sometimes comes with working in healthcare. 
And one resource here is the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. has a Center for Medicine and Spirituality. And that's really what they deal with. They deal with, you know, the spiritual lives of health care providers. Uh, I heard the director speak recently. I was very impressed with what she had to say. So we're almost at 1 o'clock, but I want to stop there and give you a chance to, if you have any comments you'd like to share with the group, uh, any questions, um, or want to go into something a little deeper that we may have only touched on. <coughs> Does anything change? Like, I, most of you were at work this morning, but I was at home, and I heard on one of the shows that soon we're going to, most of us, be living to 120. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't know if we can extrapolate those figures there, but if that is accurate for the next hundred years, it could be. But obviously, life expectancy is increasing, and genetics, you know, if we discover genetic ways of altering uh, aging, I don't think I'd be willing to say 120 yet, but we're pushing on 100. A lot of people live to be 100 now. Anybody else? One of the big reasons that uh, no one has more interest in their, in, you know, funeral care or preparing for when you die, our family's preparing when a loved one dies, is uh, they, don't, they don't think about the fact that we are all dying just some more rapidly than others. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's denial that it's going to happen to you at the time. Yeah, Daniel Callahan, an ethicist, said once that if we would just acknowledge that death is the natural outcome of all health care, <laughs> you know, we'd be better off. <laughs> <clears throat> but you're right, there is a kind of denial there, and it's both patients and providers. You know, none of us like this. I worked in rehab a lot, or did before I retired, and often we'd confront about patients with no purpose of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found a trick by saying, you have a purpose, somebody loves you. Mm -hmm, that's right, and that's where the community part of this comes in. You know, the patients who die alone and isolated, it'd be easy for them to come to that conclusion. But when you're in a circle of family and friends, which is where we should be when we die, then it's pretty hard to say that. Yeah, a very good point. Thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. as a pastor on the front line, I've noticed that um, um, I am seeing more people come into the church with um, kind of the ideology that if they have a family member that died, then um, some kind of way God messed up. Mm -hmm. And we're losing that. Um, we're having to reteach that. I see um, a lot of the popular aspects of religion teach more about what we can do to enjoy life mm -hmm. instead of the reality that death is a transition into every promise that you know, God has given to us. Right. Um, it, it, it is. It's increasingly more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of that is due to prosperity. I mean, people who live in very Absolutely. poor parts of the world, which is most of the world's population, do not have the luxury of entertaining ideas like that, you know. <laughs> They're in too close touch with it. <laughs> well, it's true. You know, those, uh, if any of you were raised Catholic, you might remember the Baltimore Catechism, which generations of Catholics got their faith from. But there was a question in there, why did God make me? And the answer was to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and to be happy with him in the next. And ultimately, to be happy with him in the next was the real reason that God created us. Yes, we have human physical life. It's a great good, but it's not it. It's not the whole reason why God created us. So our whole lives are oriented toward dying, in a sense, because that's why God created us, to be with him forever in heaven. But we get a lot of, there are a lot of distractions along the way. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful. It was a pleasure to get to know all of you. <clears throat>